Bun găsit la emisiunea Știință și Cunoaștere! În continuarea episodului de data trecută, o să vă prezentăm o serie de informații foarte tulburătoare. Invitatul special al emisiunii este omul de știință, filozof și gânditor, autorul mai multor cărți de răzunet internațional, Howard Bloom. Despre Howard Bloom vă pot spune că are o pregătire multidisciplinară. El este un om despre care s-a afirmat pe una din televiziunile britanice că ar putea fi următorul dintre cei mai importanți raționaliști contemporani alături de Newton, Darwin, Einstein și Freud. Gear Magazine îl apreciază ca fiind următorul Stephen Hawking. Pe cât ar putea să pară de exagerate și subiective aceste păreri, pe atât de șocante și uimitoare sunt datele sale biografice din care voi menționa doar o mică fracțiune. Howard Bloom a absolvit la Universitatea New York primind calificativele magna cum laude și fi capa beta. El este fondator al proiectului de paleopsihologie internațională, fondator și președinte al Comitetului de Coordonare a Dezvoltării Spațiului, membru al Comitetului de Înființare a Societății de Evoluție, membru fondator al Consiliului Proiectului Darwin, membru în Consiliul de Conducere al Societății Naționale a Spațiului, membru al Academiei de Științe din New York, membru în Asociația Americană pentru Progresul Științelor, membru în Societatea Americană de Psihologie, în Academia de Științe Politice, în Societatea de Comportament și Evoluție, Societatea Internațională pentru Etiologie Umană și membru al Comitetului Științific Consultativ al Fundației Lifeboat, alături de Ray Kurzweil. Fundația Lifeboat s-a constituit prin afilierea a peste 2000 de oameni de știință ale căror preocupări se intersectează cu misiunea ei declarată public în felul următor. Citez. Fundația Lifeboat este o organizație non-guvernamentală și fără scop patrimonial dedicată să încurajeze descoperirile științifice și în același timp să ajute umanitatea să supraviețuiască riscurilor existențiale și posibilității folosirii greșite sau abuzive a tehnologiilor din ce în ce mai redutabile, ce includ ingineria genetică, nanotehnologia, robotica și inteligența artificială, în contextul deplasării noastre către o singularitate tehnologică. Fundația LifeBot urmărește o diversitate de opțiuni ce includ contribuția la accelerarea dezvoltării tehnologiilor pentru apărarea umanității, inclusiv noile metode de a combate virusii, strategii de apărare eficace la nivel nanotehnologic și chiar autonomia coloniilor spațiale în cazul în care alte strategii defensive eșuează. Avem câteva dintre cele mai strălucite minți ale planetei care lucrează la programe ce ne pot asigura supraviețuirea. Comitetul consultativ al fundației Lifeboat este dedicat ajutorării omenirii pentru a supraviețui riscurilor existențiale sau posibilității întrebuințării greșite a tehnologiilor din ce în ce mai puternice. Am încheiat citatul. Sunt deosebit de onorat și recunoscător pentru faptul că am regăsit numele profesorului indian și va soma Sundaram printre membrii Comitetului Consultativ ai Fundației Lifeboat, deoarece pentru prima dată cartea, cercetările plus două emisiuni TV, știință și cunoaștere sunt menționate pe cel mai distins website al celor mai apreciați oameni de știință, căror activitate răspunde misiunii și scopului Lifeboat. Citez de pe pagina oficială. Profesorul Siva are 37 de ani de experiență în cercetare, peste 45 de articole publicate. Este autorul și editorul cărții Interacțiune ale produselor naturale asupra genomului, editor și coautor al Biotransformării sub influența psihicului. A participat la două emisiuni TV difuzate la televiziunea română Știință și Cunoaștere, având tema Transformări biologice, partea 1 și partea 2. Linkurile acestor materiale sunt oferite în folosul membrilor interesați pentru a le consulta și comenta în vederea avansării acestui studiu. Documentele de pe contul ResearchKey dovedesc fezabilitatea acestei cărți pentru ridicarea nivelului de calitate a vieții și combaterea îmbătrânirii. Această carte ar putea avea un impact direct în misiunea și viziunea Fundației Lifeboat. Am încheiat citatul. Printre subiectele pe care le-am discutat cu filozoful și omul de știință Howard Bloom, menționez următoarele. Dezvoltarea non-lineară a progresului tehnologic. 20.000 de ani de progres în secolul 21. Creșterea exponențială a ratei de creștere exponențială a dezvoltării progresului tehnologic. Apariția unei noi specii umane, semi-artificiale, a cărei inteligență o va depăși pe aceea oamenilor și atingerea singularității tehnologice, transmigrarea de la inteligența biologică la cea non-biologică. Apariția primilor oameni cu software și nanoboți 
care îi vor face nemuritori, conștiință sintetică și nivele ultra avansate de inteligență, apariția rupturii în țesătura istoriei omenirii, deoarece lucrurile se produc o viteză mai mare decât cea cu care istoria le poate conceptualiza și multe alte lucruri care vor conduce spre atingerea stării de singularitate tehnologică. Așadar, o explozie infinită de cunoaștere și progres. Citeam mai nou, fizicienii au simulat o gaură neagră superfluidică care se comportă asemenea heliului lichid. Sau cercetări legate de învierea pacienților morți din spitale declarați morți din punct de vedere cerebral. Polialiaj mimetic, metal, lichid, biosticlă și altele. Howard Bloom înțelege lucrurile, fenomenele și tiparele de gândire într-un mod intuitiv care pur și simplu sfidează rațiunea. Ceea ce veți afla în minutele următoare nu seamănă cu nimic din tot ceea ce v-am prezentat până acum la știință și cunoaștere. Iar aceste informații nu le găsiți nicăieri pe internet, cu excepția cărților sale. Nu am întâlnit până acum un gânditor liber, free thinker, și nici nu știam prea bine ce înseamnă aceasta. Howard Bloom gândește liber în sensul că el gândește dincolo de șabloanele și tiparele pe baza cărora majoritatea dintre noi am fost obișnuiți să gândim. Acest fapt șochează, deoarece el ne conduce spre fațete ale realității înconjurătoare care pur și simplu ne scap atenției. Nici măcar nu bănuim că acele fațete ne scap atenției. Din potrivă, suntem aproape convinși că ceea ce știm despre lume, biologie, societate, economie și politică este exact ceea ce cred toți ceilalți că știu. Howard Bloom scrie de mai multă vreme o carte care are deja 7200 de capitole. Cuprinsul cărții este accesibil pe pagina sa de web și are 512 pagini. Vă invit acum să vedeți partea a doua a interviului înregistrat în data de 13 iunie 2017. I watched a TV series called Humans, two seasons of eight episodes, and I encountered the next idea. When a software embedding an artificial intelligence becomes sufficiently complex, then it can transform into a synthetic consciousness. If a conscious synthetic is connecting online, then it can learn everything. Well, I'm sure that we will have synthetic consciousnesses eventually. Um, in 2010, the Office of the Department of Defense in the United States threw a forum based on my book, Global Brain, and it brought in people from uh, the State Department, the Energy Department, DARPA, IBM, and MIT. Now, the DARPA person was funding a project to create an artificial brain, that is, an electronic brain, with so many microprocessors that it emulated the human brain and eventually would bring forth, he felt, an emergent property, intelligence. And the person from IBM's uh, Almaden Labs in California who was at the table with us, he was the guy, the DARPA guy, was giving the money to, to operate that brain. And it was a brain called Deep Blue Genes, and it had uh, a brain, uh, it was a computer. Um, a massively parallel processed computer, which is how supercomputers are run these days. Your brain is most massively parallel processed. Your brain has 100 billion neurons all running together at the same time and communicating with each other. That's a massively parallel processed intelligence. Most computers operate on a serial intelligence. That is everything, all the information is shot through just one narrow little uh, tunnel of information in the microprocessor. These days, if you've got a quad system, it'll shoot it through four tunnels. But um, in the brain, it's 100 billion cells operating all at once. And that's what the, the IBM Elbedan guy was doing in his computer Deep Blue Genes. He had 157,756 um, microprocessors all operating in parallel in the hope that that would bring forth this sudden blinding emergent property of consciousness. It didn't work. I mean, they were the best they were able to do in those days, in 2010, seven years ago, was to emulate two seconds of a mouse's, the operation of a mouse's brain. Um, and while things have changed since then, my, my friend Dharmendra Moda, who is the guy doing this at IBM, is still doing it. And at this point, 
he's up to a computer that I believe has millions of microprocessors. I don't understand the name. Yes, it's Dharmendra, D-H-A-R-M-E-N-D-R-A, -E Moda, M-O-D-H-A. So Dharmendra is still attempting this with millions, I believe he has millions at this point, of microprocessors, and I adore him. I think that he's just one of the most creative and ebullient people that I've ever met in my life, but I don't think he's going to achieve it with raw numbers because emergent properties are very, very strange, Christian. Um, they, they pop forth in a way that we humans have not yet learned to explain, to anticipate, or to emulate. Well, yes, we emulate them with our own human inventions. But uh, let me give you an example what I, of what I mean. Once upon a time there was a nothing, at least this is the way current cosmology goes, and from that nothing came a pinprick infinitely smaller than a pinprick, and it exploded into a Big Bang. And in that Big Bang were properties that the nothingness had never ever seen before. Space, time, and speed. And space, time, and speed precipitated the way that raindrops precipitate out of a storm cloud into things that seemed impossible. Things have made of nothing but space, time, and speed. Well, let me just tell you about the emergent property aspect of this. So when the, fir when the first threesomes of quarks came together, you would think quarks in, quarks out. Um, that's all you're going to get is three quarks. No. From the, mer the merger of three quarks came a radically new property called the neutron. From the merger of another three quarks in a different form came another radically new, pro pro new property, the proton. That's what we call emergent properties. Startling, surprising properties that seem to come out of nowhere when certain things converge and work together with each other. And that's what we're looking for in consciousness using, at this point, several million microprocessors. To get up to the human level, it has to be 100 billion microprocessors. But then, is there some other form of architecture at work here that we don't perceive, aside from raw numbers, that makes consciousness possible? We don't know. We still know too little about consciousness. It's an emergent property. And there's a certain element of shock, surprise, awe, and magic about emergent properties, and anything that's magic is something we don't understand yet. Yes, but this is exactly what that movie is trying to tell us. When a software embedding an artificial intelligence becomes sufficiently complex, then it can transform into a synthetic consciousness. Right, and when you, when you get a synthetic consciousness, you get, as you know from your experience, owning a, synth or owning a consciousness, and I know from my experience owning a consciousness, we ache for how little we know. The amount that any individual consciousness can know is very, very tiny. And that's going to be true of synthetic consciousness as well, of technological consciousness. It's going to ache for how little it knows. And the fact is, how can I put this? The process of knowing is a process of inventing. Um, we invent new categories, we invent new concepts. Those are concepts and categories the world has never seen before. We invent them, we think, in order to herd information the way that a shepherd herds sheep. So we think that all we're doing is herding sheep. No, we're doing something more than that. We are creating whole new structures, and other people will see those structures with which we comprehend what we think of as reality, as realities in their own, and will build new structures upon them. So there is no end, there is no way to understand everything because everything is constantly on the increase. Does that make any sense? Yes, but there is a solution that I had just found on the internet. Aha! <laughs> and here are two photos that I'm sending them now to you. Okay. The first world com quantum computer ever built. One million times faster than our best laptop we ever seen. One million times faster. Well, that's, that's fantastic, and it would be terrific, but again, it's going to take somebody inventing a use um, to make use of these things. Can you see how big they are? Well, these are actually huge. These are big. There's a man standing behind them, and they're twice as tall as he is. These things are, are uh, 12 feet tall. They're big. They're very, very big. But if, you know, first we have to invent them, and, and we've been trying, um, and hopefully these will work. 
and then we have to find uses for them and it's finding uses for things like the guys who with ways like like Steve Jobs and and um, and Bill Gates finding ways to use these new chips that the government had put out in the 1970s and um, and finding ways uh, like like a Steve Case at AOL finding a way to use this thing that only professors were using at the time the internet and use it to send email for normal human beings to send email these things await the users to come up with new inventions they still await human invention and when, and believe me when we get up to the point where the artificial intellect intelligences are doing invention too that will be fabulous absolutely fabulous and it will only lead, it will only add to the range of things that we plus our new machine companions can do it's it's going to be wonderful and i presume this doesn't worry you Uh, this is why these kind of quantum computers might get us close to create a synthetic consciousness. Which would be absolutely wonderful, because believe me, we can use the company. Um, it's the, To me, the most ominous movie is, in its own strange way, is the movie She. Have you seen it? I didn't watch the, the movie Her. But uh, the other one, I was telling you, the TV series entitled Humans, having two seasons of eight episodes each, they are really amazing, and I must convince you to watch these episodes. Well, send me an email, because I'll, I'll ask my assistants to find it um, on the cable and tape it for me. Yes, I'll do that shortly after closing part two of our interview. Please explain another quote. I am not sure if this is amazing or disturbing or both. And the quote is, ultra high levels of intelligence that expand outward in the universe at the speed of light. Yeah, now that's a tricky one because in a sense, um, some aspect of our electronic intelligence has been speeding out at the speed of light. And it's been doing it ever since 1922 when 600 radio stations uh, were licensed in North America. Um, and it's the radio waves and television waves that we've been sending out. And those are carrying a message, at least, about our existence here on Earth for quite a bit of time. Intelligences moving at the speed of light? That's beyond my imagining because intelligence is hardware-based. Uh, you're a piece of hardware, I'm a piece of hardware. The, the hundred billion neurons we've been talking about, not to mention the 200 million neurons in our gut, which are a part of the thinking process, not to mention the, the, the uh, hypothalamic pituitary axis, which includes your adrenal cortical uh, hormones. All these are part of your mind. All of these are part of what you think of as your brain. Without this hardware, the intelligence that we know as you and me and the artistic soul that we know as you and me simply would not exist. So we know of no form of intelligence that could be hardware independent. And it would take massive invention to get to the point where something was totally electron dependent and yet organized as a form of intelligence. I think we're talking science fiction beyond, beyond the year 3000. Oh, this is amazing, but the problem for me is that I'll try to understand the words and sentences that I read on that special report published there on the Lifeboat Foundation website, because even the language is too advanced for me and was almost impossible to use dictionary in order to make sense in my native language, and this is why I need your explanations. For example, how could we understand the next quotation of Ray Kurzweil talking about the future and he said the technology represents a rupture in the fabric of human history. This is what could happen? Well that's what Ray Kurzweil has been claiming uh, since 1998 and, and as I said he claimed that it would happen in 2005 and it didn't and if you look at human history there have been massive saltations, massive jumps, um, leaps in technology, astonishing leaps in technology. The, the use of the stone tool um, in 3.1 million years ago, that was a massive leap forward in human possibility. 
The next big leap didn't come for 750,000 years, a very long time, almost a million years. And the first big leap was instead of flaking a tool on just one side, flaking it on both sides. That's called the Aculean hand axe that's flaked on both sides. The next big jump came probably about uh, 200,000, 250,000 years ago at the earliest, and it was, it was a, a huge change in perception. It was a change in perception in which garbage was perceived as the real good, and what had been perceived as the real good was perceived as the throwaway, as garbage. You used to, to make an Aculean hand axe, um, you would chip away at one side of it until you got a sharp edge, then you would turn it over and you would chip on the other side until you got a hard edge. And you got a lot of garbage. You got a little bit, lot of little pieces of stone that came off as you were chipping. And somebody, after almost three million years of making stone tools, had a sudden realization that garbage, the flakes that came off of the axe that you were chipping, those were the real tools. They were sharp. They were... A, uh, they were basically sharp on both sides, they were sharp at the point, and if you used, and this is another major invention, if you used a handle and attached these little flakes to a handle, you could have an arrow, uh, you could make a, uh, a cutting instrument, you, and, and the things that you made were sharper than anything you'd ever been able to do with an axe. So there have been these technological leaps um, that have been coming during the entire life of humanity, and about 40,000 years ago they picked up steam, and they continued to pick up steam through the era of the, the Greek and Roman Empire. They picked up steam before the Greek and Roman Empire in the Bronze Age, in the Iron Age. You are describing the missings in human history when at those ancient times in history no one could ever perceive any progress on short term or a lifespan longer term, and the people who lived in those times could not see any evolution at all. But in our modern days, in the present time, we can observe developments from one day to another, from today until tomorrow, and almost every day a new discovery is made and published somewhere. And the day after tomorrow, the new discovery might make the first two as being obsolete, or even to invalidate them. Right. Well, it, it sort of happens. It, it would certainly have things happen much, much, much faster than they did in the days of the Bronze Age and the Iron Age. Much faster. And they even happened faster than they did in the 1800s. In the 1800s, major technological change came every 15 years. I told you that Sir Walter Scott said with absolute certainty that you could never use a steam engine to operate a form of transport. And then came the steamboat and the railroad and proved him wrong. In about 1810, uh, people looking at the, or 1820, people looking at the new railroads said you could never use them to carry passengers because if you took a human faster than 20 miles an hour, the wind would be sucked out of his lungs and he would die. <laughs> And by 1836, there was a huge crash, and the crash was built, blamed on too much speculation on, guess what, railroads carrying people at faster than 20 miles an hour. So we, we've been having these, uh, they had these technological changes, as I said, every 15 years in the 1800s. Now we have them more like every five years. But still, if you look for the really big jumps, the really big jumps have been the, the computer in 1950 the personal computer in 1983, the laptop computer in approximately 1995, the computer in the form of a phone in approximately 2007, and we're still waiting for the next really big thing. I mean, there are big things, there are big things happening in space right now, that's a whole other subject. But, and if you look at all the things that I've just outlined, they are all simply ways of taking advantage of an invention from roughly 18, 1948, an invention that actually Charles Babbage had come up with back in the 1900s, or the 1800s, and that is the computer. And uh, what's the next big thing aside from the computer? 
That's going to be huge, whatever it is, but we don't know what it is yet. Yeah, even, but Even with the quantum computer, we're talking about simply incremental increases of something we already take for granted, the computer. Yes, but this one is very real and, and it costs two billion dollars. Oh my god, I don't think you can afford one or I can afford one quite yet. Yes, yes. We certainly won't carry a spare one around in our pocket for a while. Yes, yes, but since it is already present, we can expect a new breakthrough somewhere in the next 10 years or so. I would think so, I would think you're right, we shall see. Let me quote another very disturbing information. In the year 2000, Bill Joy, co-founder and chief scientist of Sun Microsystems, recognized today as the Edison of the Internet, he wrote the following. Why the future doesn't need us? Our most powerful 21st century technologies, robotics, genetic engineering and nanotechs, are threatening to make humans an endangered species. And he published that in the Wired magazine. Right, I read it and I thought it was silly <laughs> back in 2001 when I read it because, as I said, these uh, visions of doom have been with us for a long time. You know, there was a guy named uh, uh, William Miller in 1837, I think it was, who predicted that the world was about to end and he predicted it so passionately and so persuasively that he had thousands of followers and they all sold off their earthly possessions because William Miller told them exactly the day that the world was going to end. And then the world didn't end, and there they were without their possessions. So William Miller went back to his drafting table and did a lot more arithmetic and uh, looked at the Bible some more and realized that he'd made a mistake and that the date was coming up in another year. And once again, he gathered thousands of followers and they waited for the world to end and the world didn't end. Well, do you know the religion that he founded was called Adventism, and it still has 20 million adherents today, even though the world never ended? Apocalyptic predictions are easy. Accurate predictions of the next paradise are hard. And the hardest thing of all, Christian, and this is probably the most important point I will make this night, is that perceiving the paradise that you are in at the very moment, at this very moment, is the hardest thing of all. And yet, you have to perceive it if you're going to build on it, if you're going to, if you're going to give other people the joy that she, they should be getting out of the powers that they have attained that simply didn't exist five years ago. This is very interesting what you had just said, because not long ago, before we have these discussions, I had posted an announcement on my Facebook page about the intention of making this interview. And many people expressed their fears about technology, and that the technology could end our very existence. And I wrote to them not to worry about, and uh, I am now happy that the answers I wrote to them are now in the past, three or four days before the, uh, this actual recording, which took place in the morning of Tuesday 13th, 2017. And I wrote on that post, please do not worry and trust my TV guests. And uh, some of them I wrote uh, in June 19th and others in June 12th without anticipating what would be your answer. So it was just a lucky guess. The specialists and scientists that I am talking to, they said that technology will be for our benefit. And I said to uh, them that I have proof for that. And they didn't believe uh, what I was writing. Well, I certainly, I know it's going to be. And yes, but now I know that you confirm that, and I'm so happy that finally all these are taking us into our benefit and not to end our very existence. Well, let's think of this out from a slightly different point of view. In two weeks, I will be 74 years old. Um, Congratulations. <laughs> thank you. Uh, this morning, I did uh, 700 push-ups without stopping. Can you imagine that? I couldn't do that when I was 19 years old. It, when I was a child, if a person was 74 years old, he was becoming senile and he was old and doddering. He had a hard time walking. I don't have a hard time walking. I walk five miles a day and some days I walk, on a really rare day, I'll walk nine or ten miles. Um, today I will have walked about four and a half miles altogether. Um, that's Im that was impossible 
when I was a child, Christian. It was impossible when you were a child. We couldn't be young at the age of 74. I swear I am stronger, healthier, and have more enthusiasm about life than I had when I was 19 years old. Is there anything in technology that is accounted for this? Well, air conditioning has a lot to do with it. Um, the quality of shoes that we have today, even homeless people in America have these incredible running shoes that are designed to be, uh, old shoes were four pounds, new shoes are a half a pound, or at most a pound. They are easier to use, they save you energy with every step that you take. Um, we have uh, an insulation material now. When I was a child, I grew up in a town called Buffalo, New York, and we had three feet of snow every winter. Um, the snow sometimes was as high as my chest as a child, and our mothers dressed us in snowsuits. Those snowsuits weighed a ton, and it took a half an hour to get you into one. Today, a, an outfit that can protect you against that kind of cold is so thin that you can wrap it up in a ball, and you can put it into a plastic bag and put it in your knapsack. It weighs almost nothing. Um, do any of these, and look at what we do with the computers. I'm able to listen to music on Pandora. Pandora is a personal DJ. It's a computerized DJ that tries to get to know what I like and is anxious to feed me new music that I like and to continue to feed me old music that it knows that I love. And it is happy to receive my indications of which music I love in particular and which music I'd rather not hear anymore. Um, I have this personalized DJ traveling with me in earbuds. Do you know that when hi-fi was introduced in the 1950s, people used their hi-fi systems as status symbols. And to really have a status symbol that brought girls to your side, you needed to have hi-fi speakers that were as big as refrigerators that were six feet high. That showed your masculinity. When, um, when Sony, in the late 1970s, came up with the idea of putting an entire Wi-Fi system in a little tiny box that could fit in the palm of your hand and putting the speakers into little things you could fit in your ears, I thought they were insane. I thought I was absolutely certain no one would ever go for it. Well, it was the Walkman. Yes, but please try to see these things hard to believe from our perspective, those which are living in Romania, because our is very hard to believe such things being possible, because our unexamined intuition provides the impression that progress changes at the rate that we have experienced recently, and not more than that. This is how we see from our place and point of view. Well, we do too. And this is the only way we see things getting developed, and that means progress changes at the rate that we have previously experienced, not more than that. Uh, what you are telling uh, us is still very hard to cope and to adapt to, because I see these things happening in other countries, but not in Romania. And it's really shocking and terrifying. Well, I, here I am in another country, and it's not the most advanced country in the world anymore. It's one of the most advanced countries in the world. And yet the, change, the major changes are happening not exponentially, but incrementally. And as I said, we, we are still elaborating on a 1948 um, design. We're still elaborating on the computer. We haven't jumped into a whole new cat. We haven't invented a whole new category of technology yet. We seem to be inventing a new category with artificial intelligence, but as I said, the first ideas of artificial intelligence came with John von Neumann in the 1930s and 1940s. Um, and they've had their ups and they've had their downs, and right now they're having an up again. Change doesn't happen the way Ray Kurzweil keeps preaching it changes. Um, it happens incrementally. And because of this remarkable stability of the human guidance system, this uh, gyroscopic stability of the sense of human nature. Um, we take it in stride. Um, in fact, with every new miracle, we don't realize we have just been gifted with a material miracle, with entirely new human powers. We are constantly dissatisfied and looking for the next miracle, um, or dissatisfied because it hasn't come, or certain that disaster 
is just around the corner. We are never satisfied. It pays every once in a while to take a little bit of time and look at the powers you have today that you did not have when you were five years old and realize how astonishingly blessed, how amazingly blessed you are. Yes, but you and I agreed for making important changes in our lives, but other people at our ages are suffering all kinds of diseases and cannot understand what we are doing or saying and why we are feeling better and better against the passage of time, while mostly others are not doing better while time flies from one day to another. They are doing worse and worse and worse every day. So this is a discrepancy. Well, there's a discrepancy because this is something that depends only partly on technology and depends on something very old-fashioned called human will. Christian, you have taken you have taken a great deal of time and pain to learn your body and to learn how to maximize your body. And you have taken enormous self-discipline to make sure that you are far healthier than the normal human being, despite the fact that, like other humans, you've had illnesses and you've had serious problems. I was in bed for 15 years with an illness so serious I couldn't have another person in the room with me for five years, and I couldn't speak. I didn't have the strength to speak for five years. And that illness forced me to learn how to use those things that are currently available to maximize my body's ability to live. And so I take 30 different drugs. Now I have to. I had to get, I thought I'd never get out of that bedroom in my life, Christian, ever. So I now take 30 different pills. I have a very different regimen from the standard human regimen. I don't sleep at normal human hours. I don't eat the way normal humans do. But look at the consequence. 700 push-ups at the age of 74. I didn't imagine when I was, when I was 19 that I could ever do more than nine. I, I got to 92 when I was 19. And it wasn't because I wasn't working at it, I was working at it. Um, and now I can do 700, that's ridiculous. And do we call... No number for oh, to my, as a hang on, my, this, is, this is the benefit of new technology, I'm showing you my cell phone. Would you like to call? Wait, because my cell phone is, thinks I'm talking to it, and is busy talking to me, and I have no idea of how to get it to stop. Um, well, okay, it's shut up for the minute. I mean, this is technology intruding into our lives. Uh, this is an artificial lack of intelligence um, in my cell phone. So there are things outside the range of the technologies that, that um, Ray, Ray Kurzweil works with, and we know he has health problems these days, and we know he is seeking his way to maximize what his body can accomplish, and I hope he is as successful as you and me at finding things that give him outrageous strengths that people our age simply have never had in the past, because that's what we have. Um, and it's a privilege that our children are going to have, and they're going to have even more of it, because for every three years of life, we're adding approximately, for every three years we live, we add approximately one month of life. We're increasing the human lifespan on a regular basis, and we don't know how we're doing it. We're increasing the rate of peace in society, and we don't know how we're doing it. In fact, if you let me run down a few of the material miracles of modern society that we should be not only grateful for, but that we should feel an obligation to increase on behalf of our great-grandchildren, um, since 1850, we have doubled, more than doubled the human lifespan. The human lifespan... And about that, about that, let me quote another invention which is now almost on the way to be tested on human passions and after more than 35 years research, one American scientist is on a breakthrough to discover that kind of treatment which will reverse aging, cure all age-related diseases, and make us living up to 200 years. Which researcher is that? Is that Aubrey de Grey? No, it's Michael Fossil. Oh, I don't know his work. Yes, but it's really amazing, and he has only nine months left, and after these nine months of final steps of his research, he will go on to clinical trial. Do you, do you know what his treatment is? It's called the telomerase activator. But this is not what we have on the Internet. He said that these are only fakes, and they are not producing any age reversal, do not take off wrinkles, and these products barely produce five effects from what he is trying to do in the near future 
with his telomerase activator. Well, I'm on a drug, one of the 30 drugs that I use, that actually does reverse muscle aging, and it is called oxytocin. And there, there's a, a form of experiment called parabiosis. You take a young rat and you hook its circulatory system up to the circulatory system of an older rat, and the older rat, whose brain has been aging, his kidneys have been aging, his heart has been aging, all of a sudden, his brain, his heart, and his kidneys go through a reversal. They begin to get younger. So the scientists doing these parabiosis experiments have been trying to figure out what the active ingredients might be. And the first active ingredient that they have uh, isolated is oxytocin. Yes, but Michael Fossil already told me, and I have four hours of interview with him, and I will send you the links, because you must watch these discussions, which are literally amazing. Well, this, this oxytocin is not an age-related drug. You've heard of it before. Oxytocin is, uh, was originally used to relax a woman's womb when she's giving birth. Yes, but there is another one called astragalozides. Oh, I, I don't know that one, because oxytocin is the one that I use, and, and I suspect it's the reason that I, well, last week I did 800 push-ups in a row without stopping twice So uh, during the week, and then I fell down to as few as 500. Okay, let me send you the links to these four hours recordings with Professor Michael Fossel, and then write me some feedback, and for now, let's go back to Moore's Law, which is talking about doubling the number of transistors on a chip. And let's examine some of the past decades. For example, the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s. At that time, we were told that the progress is only doubling. But then, after the year 2000, we were told that in the computer area, the speed and the number of transistors per chip will double at every six months. Moore's law is talking about the exponential shrinking of transistor size on an integrated circuit. Right. That's why you have, that's why you have a computer. When I realized that when I came down with chronic fatigue syndrome and I was stuck in my bed, um, eventually I realized that I was going to have to get two computers set up next to the bed and operate them with a single monitor and a single keyboard. Why two computers? Because computers, personal computers, were not that bright. In those, in the early days, when I got, when I computerized my office in 1983, um, all we had were floppy drives for memory. Then hard drives came along. The biggest hard drive I was a ever able to get was 20. I don't even remember 20k. 20, no, it had to be 20. It was 20 something or other, but it was very small by modern standards. And today, and, and then it was a big deal to have 250 megabyte and, and 500 megabyte, and now I have a terabyte in my, um, in my laptop, and I have eight terabytes in my backup drives. These are huge leaps um, to go from floppy disks in 1983, um, which had, God knows, 100K of memory or something like that, um, to these massive eight terabyte things, that's what Moore's Law has accomplished. But all it's accomplished is a change in the size of existing things, like memory and like processing power. It's when we have big jumps in the invention of new things, or when we take new things from the military realm, um, and which we did, which is exactly what we did with the microchip, uh, with the microprocessor, and when we invented the first personal computers. When we take some new technology from some different realm and we apply it to personal life, then things change. The big change may well be the Internet of Things, in which all of your lights are hooked up to your, you can control all of your lights with your cell phone, you can control your thermostat with your cell phone, you can find your keys with your cell phone, um, and your car gets smart and starts driving itself around. Um, if you can tell your car, if you can leave your car behind and tell it to park itself, that would be wonderful. But I'm still looking. Christian, I'm so dependent on my laptop that I carry it with me everywhere. That means I carry a knapsack that weighs about 15 pounds. And I feel like the Volga boatman bent over with my labors. Um, it is, it's painful 
to carry around a load that big every day. Well, where is my robot to carry it around for me? Where is the technology that is somehow going to have relieve me of this insane pain? It's not going to come during my lifetime. And it's the kind of uh, um, not incremental technology, but and you can't call it excremental technology because that certainly has bad implications. Um, but where is the techno the out of the box technology that's going to relieve me of those burdens? Where is the out of the box technology that's going to be my genie in a bottle? For 20 years, I've been um, conceptualizing a thing I call the ultimate chip. And it's your genie in a bottle. It figures out what you need before you know that you need it. Um, and it goes out shopping on the web for you and it finds it. If you need a new mate, it finds you a new mate. If you need, uh, if you need a new technology, it finds you the new technology. If you need a new program, it finds you the new program. And it doesn't depend on hardware. Um, it reads your mind. Let me change the tape and I thank you greatly for the part two of our very long interview about the development of technology and I'll meet you later for part three, the final part of our amazing discussion. I also thank you again for recording your answers with your own 4K high quality camera. This will improve a lot our technical quality of the program. Bloom este un om cu o viziune de ansamblu care îi permite să înțeleagă și să comenteze aproape orice idee, lucru sau fenomen social, elaborând păreri originale, unice, care sunt foarte apreciate. Howard Bloom a scris în cărțile sale o idee foarte importantă. Citez. Priviți cu atenție asupra tuturor lucrurilor pe care dumneavoastră și ceilalți le luați drept bune și adevărate și începeți să le discutați ca și când nu le-ați mai întâlnit niciodată. Eu împărtășesc cu optimismul lui Howard Bloom care vede societatea umană îndreptându-se armonios spre o lume frumoasă și din ce în ce mai echilibrată. O lume în care crimele, neajunsurile și bolile vor dispărea treptat cu ajutorul tehnologiilor și a inteligențelor artificiale ce ne vor însoți în secolul următor. Chiar dacă majoritatea dintre noi nu vom apuca să fim martori acestor realizări, ele sunt fabuloase, formidabile și îmi dau o stare de entuziasm. Poate chiar mai mult decât atât, dacă activatorul telomerazei descoperit de Michael Fossil își va dovedi eficiența, atunci generațiile celor care suntem acum în viață vom apuca să vedem primii pași ai omenirii spre o dezvoltare ce poate culmina în cele din urmă cu acea singularitate tehnologică greu de prezis, în care Ray Kurzweil își pune atât de multe speranțe. Serialul despre ultramedicină pe care tocmai l-ați vizionat în emisiunile din urmă ne dovedește cât de intens, uimitor și fascinant este progresul tehnologic. Știința este o cunoaștere aranjată și clasificată în conformitate cu adevărul, faptele și legile generale ale naturii. Știința, de fapt, este cel mai bine definită ca o căutare atentă, disciplinată, logică, de cunoștință despre toate aspectele Universului obținute prin examinarea celor mai bune dovezi disponibile și este întotdeauna supusă unor operațiuni de corecție și îmbunătățire pe baza descoperirii unor dovezi mai bune. Aceasta a fost partea a doua a interviului cu Howard Bloom despre cele mai îngrijorătoare subiecte legate de evoluția tehnologică prezisă de vizionarul Ray Kurzweil. Fiți alături de noi data viitoare la o nouă întâlnire cu știință și cunoaștere.